Good evening, and welcome to Odd Salon Resilient, our very first online salon. I'm Trey Balchowski, one of the founders of Odd Salon. So it should be no surprise to our regulars that we, the founders of Odd Salon, have a long-standing curiosity for the dark times surrounding plagues, pandemics, and mass-scale human loss. We can be relied upon to answer the question, where are you from, with a long-winded answer that includes the San Francisco plague outbreak when a Lyft driver asks he didn't want to know, or waving our hands wildly at cocktail parties talking about really bad idea plague cures because we can't make polite conversation. When we travel, we seek out plague monuments and ossuaries and beautiful graveyards. And while to the outside that might seem like a morbid curiosity, to me it's really about learning from those who have survived and gaining perspective. When Mayor Breed ordered all large events canceled, we spent a week clicking the refund button on Eventbrite and wondering what's to come next. When San Francisco and New York announced their first wave of shelter in place, we went to our bookshelves and started rereading the books about the times of plague and disease. I turned to the Spanish flu, a mass epidemic across the whole country, but specifically I was looking at San Francisco, which had over 45,000 cases and killed between 3,000 and 3,500 people in the fall of 1918 and the winter of 1919. Yes, I looked at stats and charts, but more than that, I looked at stories, human stories. Those human stories helped me cope. It was reading the timeline in the stories from 100 years ago that allowed me to mentally prepare for this three-week shelter-in-place notice to turn into a multi-month lockdown. It was reading stories of protesters who refused to wear masks that allowed me to be not surprised when history repeated itself as it does in our own situation. And it was looking at the stats and the stories of the second wave of that flu that has mentally prepared me as much as one can be for these dark times to become even darker. The historical context of the Spanish flu in San Francisco, a city I very much love, and the resilience of the citizens a hundred years ago who rose up from the flames just like the phoenix on their city flag. Those stories, their resilience, lent me a starter kit of resilience. We chose the image of the phoenix for tonight's salon, not because it appears on the, Sp the San Francisco flag, but because of its inherent reminder of rebirth. And perhaps more importantly, because of the flames, because it is the flames where we gain our resilience. We're not born with resilience. Those who e live easy lives, who never struggle and who never face devastation, they don't magically become resilient. We earn resilience by going through the bullshit, the worst times in our lives, the worst moments in history. Resilience is found as we are walking through the flames. But why do we celebrate resilience other than the fact that it helps us survive these dark times? Well, resilience is the learned skills that allowed us to take risks. It's that little voice inside of us that says, sure, take that crazy lit risk. And if it lands you in hell, well, you've already been there and you know how to get back. In telling stories, in chronicling the dark times, and how we got through them, we share our resilience with our friends, families, colleagues, and with future generations. We show them that there's a path through the flames, which is part of what we're doing tonight. And as we tell these stories throughout the night, during our first, on, uh, uh, <laughs> during our first online salon, we are consistently reminded of why we can't gather in person. There is a pandemic burning outside our doors. This moment, right now, is not so much the phoenix as it is the flames. Hi, everyone. I'm Anetta Black. I'm also a co-founder of Odd Salon, and I want to pick up where Trey left off. We chose this image of the phoenix as a symbol for resilience for this evening, but 
Before we chose that, there were some other options that we considered. They thought about considering the tardigrade, the water bear. It's nature's nearly immortal ultimate survivor. It lives in hot springs in the Himalayas. It was the first animal known to survive exposure in outer space. It, is, it has an excellent prospect to be a microscopic protagonist in a version of I Am Legend. And they're also known as moss piglets. We also thought about the amazing Yeti crab. It's a blind crustacean that can endure extreme water pressure, no sunlight, and depths of up to 2,300 feet underwater. Living at the edge of the freezing Antarctic Ocean and boiling water coming out of underwater vents. We also thought about this very sassy cockroach in a top hat, shown on date night in the end times. We could have also looked at other kinds of endurance and human resilience, how overwintering in Antarctica can either break you or make you stronger, or both, like a frozen hell version of the Nietzsche saying. But instead, we specifically wanted to look at the resilience of individuals and communities who faced plague and pandemics, who went through the flames, but bent instead of breaking. Each one of these outbreaks reveals devastation and loss and stories of survival and endurance and this surprising constant repeat motif of resilience. Since the very beginning of all of this started earlier this year, I felt that the very best thing and the very worst thing about being part of the Odslan community is the abundance of context. Historically, we've never shied away from stories of death and disease and loss. We've hosted entire salons on the themes of doomed and epidemic. As readers of history, we understand that this is not, no matter what the news says, a unique moment, but part of a continuum, one that communities have endured before and will endure again. There have been pandemics over and over again throughout history, and we should be very glad right now that we're not living in the 14th century. Speaking of which, during perhaps the darkest moment in, her, in human history, a young man fled the ravages of the Black Death that was rampaging through Europe from 1347 to 1351. The bubonic plague was, was a virus that was greatly to be feared. It was a virus similar to what we're experiencing, except that it had a mortality rate estimated to be between 30 and 50 percent. In the city of Florence, the city population was cut in half from over 100,000 to just 50,000 in only one year. Giovanni Boccaccio survived. He returned to Florence, and in 1552, just one year after the plague ended, he published the famous work that would make his reputation, the Decameron. The story is set in the countryside outside of Florence, where 10 young people take refuge in a villa to quarantine. In order to pass the time, for 10 days in a row, they each tell 10 stories, resulting in a collection of 100 tales. And you might think because of the setting that these would be very dark stories, but they're not dark at all. They're funny and sexy and ribald and a little scandalous. They were distractions from the plague time. It was the 14th century ver version of binge watching Tiger King. That book written nearly 500 years ago was a hit. It made Boccaccio's reputation. It was a bestseller in the years after the plague. It has been translated into languages all around the world. It has been illustrated by the world's greatest illustrators and interpreted by the finest artists. It has been reimagined as theater and it is still in print. The Decameron was Boccaccio's Phoenix, born of the fires of 1348. And as we listen to tonight's stories, I'd like to challenge all of us to consider the phoenix that we would like to emerge from these flames, personally and as communities. Because as history has shown, even if it feels that way right now, this won't last forever. So as we, as we kick off this first online odd salon, I'm going to turn to a story told by the 12th century Sufi poet Attar of Nishapur, in which a sultan turns to his viziers and he asks them to provide him with a saying that he can inscribe on a ring that will make him happy would he, excuse me, that will make him happy when he is sad and sad when he is happy. His viziers pondered the challenge, they went away, they considered the options, and when they returned, they presented him with a ring inscribed with a phrase that is echoed through time, and to which I'd like to raise our glasses, the first glass of the first online odd salon. As we look forward to the phoenix that will arise through these flames, please join me and raise your glass at home, because this too shall pass. Cheers. Let's do this thing. <laughs>